unfortunately, a number of other announcements, but in a sense, fortunately, because it just means a lot of good things are going on. Uh, tomorrow morning, there's going to be this international phone call by Rebuilding Alliance. Rebuilding Alliance is the group that's rebuilding houses that have been destroyed uh, in Palestine. And the first house and the first phone call is about the house that was being protected by Rachel Corey when she was killed by a bulldozer about three years ago. So she's become a real icon in the peace movement. and they're they're rebuilding that very same house. And the idea is that there will be a panel discussion with myself and a psychiatrist from Gaza by the name of uh, Dr. Uh, Iyad al-Siraj. And then anyone in the world literally can join that conversation after a bit. So this is the phone number. And it, the arrangement had been that you needed to register and pay. But now it's been thrown wide open. So anybody can just pick up the phone and dial this number at 845, if, if you'd be so kind. And then you can get the, uh, the details on how it's going to work. And the conversation actually starts at 9. So we're hoping that this will be first of a long series. And this will be a way of breaking some of the isolation with, uh, that Palestinians have been suffering from. The other announcement I want to make is con concerns today at noon. You will have handed in your papers. You're going to need a break. And uh, a woman from the ICNC, remember we talked about this group? They, they sponsored the film uh, Force More Powerful, and they, uh, which is a PBS series. And they also sponsored Bringing Down a Dictator, which we saw here. So this is the International Council on Nonviolent Conflict. And the person that they're sending is Maria Stefan, who did not answer when I left a message on her cell phone. But uh, that's neither here nor there. And she's talking about some of the statistical patterns about movements which have used violence and movements which have used nonviolence. So this will be at the Institute of International Studies. I'm very glad that they're doing it there. And that's 223 Moses today at noon. And as if that were not enough, get this, light refreshments will be provided. So bring your own latte, and you will be in very good shape. Ah, here's Carrie. The, one of the co-director, I think, of ICNC, Jacques Duval, has recently pointed out that not one single movement that used violence resulted in an improvement in human rights anywhere in the last century. Where if you use standard measures for human rights, that not one single movement that used violence led to an improvement in human rights. Might have led to a different to difference in who is abusing whom. But in terms of human rights, there was no gain. Ah, OK, OK, OK. I want to remind you that if you'll be around for the summer, I have put in a grant proposal. It's gone in yesterday. So press your thumbs or whatever you do. Die uh, Traumdücken. Uh, for uh, paid interns to work at the Meta Center this summer. There'll be six of them if we get that money. If not, we'll have six unpaid interns. Right? <laughs> Same exact work. Do they have peace power? Yeah. In 2008, we're thinking of having the second annual, or non, not annual, the second spiritual activism conference. This is the conference that uh, drew almost 1,400 people two years ago. And I want to ask you real quick, which do you think would be better timing, to have it in the spring when the semester is still going, or have it in the summer? Paolo? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Uh, it was a four-day conference last first time. Yeah, I'm not sure what it'll be this time. Uh, OK, so that's we're split right down at all. And I have absolutely nothing to report to Michael Inger. That's OK. We will cope. It'll, it'll be, we'll have to decide whether we want mostly to have students there or, or not, and how long it's going to be, so forth. Um, OK, well, 
you've got your papers. Uh, why don't you hand them in? You've got the uh, evaluation form going around now. I've often thought we should have a box of these magnetic superlatives to use for evaluation forms, just, you know, like fabulous, best class ever, stuff like that, and just plug it in. Well, I'm not suggesting that you necessarily need to do it uh, now. I'll try to stop a little bit early. So do you uh, maybe, yes, that's right. There is a, uh, a group called the Phoenix Alliance that has under, been taking up a number of actions, and one of them is that there's a fast that's uh, being participated in on at least three campuses, uh, which is about the weapons labs issue. If you want, Michael, you can write some stuff on the board about that. So I'd like to, I said that I would not introduce any new material and just open it wide up for your questions and stuff. But then over the weekend, this uh, occupational hazard strikes professors sometimes. I got all these great ideas. So I'm going to try and hold back on most of them and wait until we get the conversation rolling. But one thing I did want to share, or, or maybe two quick ones, if you don't mind. One is in a, a newsletter called In These Times, which is from, I want you to be sort of familiar with these uh, uh, organs anyway, the Signs of the Times. I mean, In These Times is something else. Signs of the Times is put out by Christian peacemaker teams. So they're one of the third-party nonviolent intervention groups, which is avowedly religious and even sectarian. They work in five or six main areas in the world. One of them is the Middle East. And they talked about a conference in a town in Palestine called Atuwani, where a woman came, a man rather, came to that town from Africa, from South Africa who had participated in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the TRC. So I was struck by this because it's another example of how civil society globally is learning, the picking up information, lessons, experience from different parts of the world. And as I've said many times, I'm very inspired by this because I think this is qualitatively new, almost. It was very, very rare in the past that information could be transferred from one nonviolent movement of one kind to another of the same kind or a different kind somewhere else in the world. But now that is uh, happening. Um, the latest issue of New Internationalist, which I've mentioned once before, this is their 400th edition. New Internationalist. I continue to be impressed, and they have a long section on the Middle East, and this, it's called 40 Years is Enough. It's about how the world is waking up to what, and Jimmy Carter has been very helpful with his book, using the word apartheid for what's going on there. And I was struck by an article by another is, uh, Palestinian psychiatrist from Gaza, whose name was Sama Jabber who um, writes the following. I know a, he's a psychiatrist, and he's working with Gazan people. I know enough about oppression to diagnose the non-bleeding wounds. Now, this struck me because I had read an article in the newspaper, violating my own suggestion never to read the newspapers, but I, I snuck one in. And this was a comment by one of these, I call them hate radio hosts. Uh, there are 15, third, what, what is it? 3,500 radio stations of this type called talk show hosts around the country, of which about 3,450 are extremely reactionary and vicious. And this is a person who was very upset by one of his colleagues having lost his position because of using a racial slur. Uh, and you probably have been reading about this story. As I've mentioned several times, racism is the only form of violence which is not OK. Nobody accepts it. So he lost his job for using these hurtful words. And his colleague said, look, this is all nonsense. Words do not hurt. And that, 
that really struck me because here's another little insight that we can gain that the denial of mind is an acceptance of violence. In itself, it could probably be considered an act of violence. But when you see, I, I, would, it, I had a flashback to an event at the Academic Senate when, once again, we were arguing for getting rid of the weapons labs, breaking what was called severance, break the connection between the university and the weapons labs, because we don't really control what they do, but we give them a patina of moral legitimacy, or a fig leaf, if you wanted to use a more anatomically correct uh, language. And uh, one of the people who was arguing that the connection did not hurt the university any said, show me one student at Berkeley who's been injured by this connection. And I got up there and I said, every single student at this university has been injured by that connection, but you can't see it because you look only at their physical bodies. And, you, know, you expect this to be like Heidelberg, you know, and they'll show up with dueling scars and say, ah, yes, they've been hurt. But every single student has been demoralized by what this university has been, is lending itself to this form of intellectual prostitution. Um, and, but I didn't get anywhere. Uh, and I don't think I could, I sat down next to a friend of mine and he said, wow, you fixed it, you know, this will finish their argument. But it didn't work. And it struck me that these, these two things are very closely intertwined, that if you want to operate a violent regime or accept it or use it in any way, you're naturally going to have to drift to materialism and a materialist interpretation of what a human being is. And conversely, if you accept that we're all just material bodies, separateness, competition, violence are absolutely inevitable. So here's a psychiatrist who's not doing that. I know about the non-bleeding wounds. And he, he says, this is very interesting, it is, uh, it, despite everything, my impression is that mental illness is still the exception not the rule in Palestine. Resilience and coping are still the norm among our people. In spite of all the home demolitions and extreme poverty, it is not in Palestine you find people sleeping in the streets or eating from trash cans, which you see right on our campus every day. This resilience is based on family foundations, social steadfastness, and spiritual and ideological conviction. That struck me as being relevant to the, our final topic in the semester that we're going out on, that something about human spirituality has got to be at the core of getting us out of a violent and into a nonviolent regime, if we can figure out what that is and how to do it. And then he goes on to say, this is crucial. It talks about their recuperative powers which is crucial if they are not to crack when peace finally comes, as is often the case in a post-war period. So this is another case of learning across cultures. They see what happens to other civilizations where they have had a resolution. You know, it reminds me a little bit of the Dalai Lama uh, bringing on a bunch of uh, Jewish people to talk to because now the, the Tibetans are living in exile. The Jews have been doing that for about 2,000 years, so maybe we can learn from each other. So here's cross-cultural learning, but also the recognition, and this is the point that I made in a number of booklets, and I think I shared it with you last semester, success can be very dangerous for nonviolent movement, because it can lead you to think, we succeeded, and the problem is over, and you go back to the same old, same old. So I came up with a new technical term. Isn't that wonderful? How often do you get a whole new technical term? That's probably worth the tuition right there. So we've talked about constructive program, of course. I talk about it more than almost anybody, because I think it's that important. And we've talked about obstructive program, which is what most people think nonviolence is purely and simply obstructive, but I think we should also talk about reconstructive program, which is what we were just recon... I can't talk and spell at the same time. 
reconstructive program, or RP. So who knows? I mean, that could show up on the final exam. It's a little bit hard on people who aren't here today, but you know, it's, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out here. Uh, <coughs> reconstructive program is the recognition that you have to rebuild relationships after a conflict has expended itself. And if you don't do that, you're just preparing the stage for the next wave, the next phase of the same conflict. And because this is getting to be something of a growth industry since the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, spread to Central America, especially Guatemala, spread to Eastern Europe, uh, all over the Balkans, uh, I think it probably deserves a new technical term by this time. Okay, so you've just watched history being made right here on the blackboard. This is very exciting. Before we get to your questions, and I finally do stop talking, which I promised I would do on Tuesday, how about we take a quick look at that passage that I emailed to all of you uh, by CourseWeb. And I'm not actually sure that I have a copy. Does somebody, did somebody print it out? Oh, Maria? Uh, it was in a book uh, called, oh, you're going to give it to me? Thanks. Okay, okay. It's from a book called um, War and Its Discontents, and it's by Jonathan Mursky, and he is the person who invented the concept. People who invent concepts are really valuable people. Uh, in fact, uh, Nietzsche said, die wirklichen Originalen sind die Namengeber. Real original people are nomenclaturists. Anyway. Enough self-congratulation here. Let's uh, get to the point. This Jonathan Mirsky is the fellow who came up with the term the nonviolent moment. OK, so here's the quote. Where the oppressor or evildoer seeks to vanquish or eradicate his victim pure and simple, there is no call for nonviolence, no space for it. Indeed, in that situation, nonviolence would do nothing but further empower the oppressor and force the oppressed to acquiesce in his or her own destruction, forfeiting human dignity in the process by ceding to the oppressor the validity of his aims. Nonviolent resistance aims to push the latent contradictions of an oppressive society to the surface. You have no quarrel with that statement. Hence, it is inapplicable in societies whose violence and oppression are not contradictions, but rather of their essence. The nonviolent moment, if you will, arises only where the oppressor does not seek annihilation, but submission. Okay, very lots of tie-ins for us in this one. I better hold on to it, actually. Give, give it right back to you. Who'd like to begin? Take out your blue pencil and start uh, flailing about here. Michael? You don't buy it. OK. OK, that's a B plus already. Let's go. Yeah, <laughs> Catherine. Um, one of the things that, um, that kind of gets into uh, the, the time of the mm -hmm. people um, people Yeah. It's so amazing. We've seen this over and over. The minute you label somebody as a jackal or a, a ravening wolf or a hippie or God knows what, uh, you've immediately shut down the whole possibility. You, can, you, you close the door to nonviolent interaction. OK, we have some stuff up here, people. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Melissa? Uh, well, he said that if, uh, now there have been movements, let's be honest about this, where the oppressed, the oppressing party, whatever we shall call those people, notice people, uh, has not been intent on converting or getting the acquisition of the victimized group, but rather of wiping them out, driving them off the territory, or what have you. And this person is arguing, and Michael is very correct in not buying it, 
that when you're faced with that kind of situation, you have no entree for nonviolence. So that's where we really, this is where the rubber hits the road for us. I think we've, we've got the preliminaries down pat. So what were you getting at, Marisa? Because you might have been going where I want you to go. Uh huh. Yes. Right. That's right. Very good. That really, I think, is the pr most important point. And this, if you could surface this point, you could have you'd have a way of rebutting this person's argument. You don't have to say no. The oppressor is not out to wipe you out. That could be. I remember this being argued even in Panama that there was a pe the people stood up in resistance and the regime didn't care. You stand up, stand down, stand sideways. We're going to do what we want to do no matter what. We have American money and you don't. So there. Elizabeth? Yes, that's another very good point that if you do your nonviolent resistance, even if it doesn't persuade the oppressor, it will do some good work and put some good energy into the system. And the next move, you'll be in a better place. That's very true. But to get back to this main point for a minute, another thing that occurred to me over the weekend, and I am sorry it was such a productive weekend. I really wanted to keep my mind shut, but it wouldn't do that. Um, take this old Quaker expression that we used last, we heard last semester. There is that of God in every man. Okay. And what if we were to modernize that, bring it up to the 20th, first century, the 21st now, right? Yeah, uh, <laughs> to the 21st century, and say, there is a capacity to recognize interconnection in every person. That's what Marisa was just talking about. So the other person can say, you know, I don't care. I just, I don't want, I don't want you around. I want you dead or, or away from here. Still, if you're really a nonviolent person, and I hope the ICNC people would go along with me here, if you're really a, non a nonviolent person, you will not allow yourself to believe that this is the essence. There has got to be that spark of humanity in every person which can be awakened, and the only way it can be awakened is through nonviolence. So on the contrary, that's the ideal situation for nonviolence because it really shows the stuff that nonviolence is made of. It's not an ideal situation in the sense that you won't get hurt. At one point, Gandhi was asked, do you think that the Jews could overcome Nazism through nonviolence? And he said, not without great suffering. But implicitly, yes, there is no situation where you can't use it. John? In any situation? A good, we ought to have a contest and <laughs> invent a term for the fact that nonviolence can be applied in any situation. Uh, let's start off with a few Sanskrit words and then you know migrate over to Hebrew and, <laughs> and just see what we can come up with. No, I, I just I like to go back to something that Gandhi said, which was that nonviolence is not the inanity it has been taken for down the ages. Inanity, meaning it's just an empty, vacuous, silly, nonsensical thing. It's a universal force, and it can be applied anywhere. I suppose universal might be the closest thing to it. It's not the sexiest word I've ever heard of, but <laughs> that might be at least a working definition. Your, your punishment, Matthias, is you have to sit in the front of the room and get, get filmed on the way in and all the rest of it. <laughs> you dealt with that very well. <laughs> yes, Alex. I was going to say also, it sounded like he said that um, because the violence is over, there's no contradiction. But I think that if yes. you there has to be. That's right. There has to be a contradiction. The root contradiction is probably the one that Marisa was pointing out, that they're contradicting something that's still alive in them, even though they're denying it. But no matter how much you go on with this, you'll find all incredible contradictions. Like it's the people who say that there is no mind who are spending $141 billion a year on advertising. $141 billion a year is what it has become. Yeah. And so forth. We've seen lots, lots of other contradictions. But yeah, that also is a very good point. Ashley?
Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah, and that has to be done from the very outset, where you won't really have a nonviolent operation going. Yeah, that's true. No, no dehumanization in any direction. The way that you awaken the capacity to empathize in another is by awakening it in yourself. And that usually means a struggle with negative drives that are telling you to demonize and reject that person. Um, uh, well, I would, I don't know, if it, yeah, well, I guess using the word oppressor or evildoer is, no, I see what you're saying, that if, if you assume that the person right down to the very core of their being has no capacity to recognize you as a human being, that is a totally dehumanizing thing to do to another person. One last thing before we leave this uh, analysis, and this is very good, by the way. The only problem on the final is you'll have to do it by yourself. <laughs> we won't get to all do it together. Um, but this is exactly the kind of thing that uh, y you want to do with these statements. One thing to add is what about some bibliography? Here we are sitting in a major research university, the darling of the world's major corporations. <laughs> I'm here to do all the research. Uh, how about an article? We can show this person. I'll give you a hint. If you took PAX 164A, if you are an A student, it was first article in the reader. I'm pretty sure. Does anybody remember back that far? <laughs> it was in the fall. We were in Wheeler Hall. <laughs> remember, it was, it was a different camera person. <laughs> The, the article was actually a chapter uh, in a book. It was written by Ralph Summy, S-U-M-M-Y, who's an Australian theorist. Uh, and it was titled, Nonviolence and the Case of the Extremely Ruthless Oppressor. Remember that? And he argued that this is opponent. There you go. OK, I get B plus, you get A. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I dehumanized them. <laughs> They're very bad. The case of the extremely ruthless opponent. You would say superficially ruthless oppositional person, to be completely correct here. But yeah, he argues very well. And in fact, he even uses these very, very fancy sociological graphs. I was extremely jealous. They have curves and lines all over the place. Definitely Nobel Prize material. Uh, I have a cartoon on my bulletin board which shows this professor opening up his mail, and it says, you may already be the winner of the Nobel Prize. <laughs> I'm going to write in for nonviolence. Um, anyway, there is that article, and he does uh, show, using the tools of social science, that nonviolence is not limited by the determination of the opponent. In fact, in many ways, the more determined, the quicker and cleaner you're going to get to a nonviolent moment and really show what you are worth. OK, good. So I'm now at your service. Stay in and so if you go. I don't want to spend a lot of time on the format of the exam. I think that's, that's pretty straightforward. I just wanted to reiterate that those of you who may have had a time problem on the midterm will probably not have a time problem on the final, because the final will have 100% more time and only maybe 20% more, 25% more material. So that should be fine. OK? And when is the final, by the way? Did you know? Tuesday? OK. I'll be there. <laughs> yeah, I'll look it up. <laughs> yeah. um, so we have talked about the application of nonviolence universally, until a better term comes along, to insurrectionary movements, then anti-militarism and other reform movements, then the struggle against globalism, early environmental struggles, and finally we talked about the building of a nonviolent culture 
and what part spiritual development would have in that. So th yes, John? I tend, final exams are cumulative, but they do tend to emphasize more and more recent material. Yeah, because it wasn't on the midterm. Yeah. But that's not reliable. It just, you know, depends. Like, some, I may dream about something over the weekend. And, you know. Okay. So enough for the substantive, for the uh, technical questions about how the exam will work. What, what, what is there this semester that your mind that you'd like to talk about needs clarification or you just thought was a good idea or a terrible idea where we should go with it, whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay, who would, who would like to talk about some of the ones that we mentioned? It is Rwanda, I think. The Gachacha. Gachacha system. Mm -hmm. But what you're thinking of is something that it isn't in among the Bemba uh, peoples in. in Sub-Saharan Africa, they don't just welcome the person. That, you know, what we're seeing here, by the way, is a kind of overlap between restorative justice and re reconstructive program, which is fine. Restorative justice is the application of these principles within a society against individual offenders. And reconstructive program, writ large, is about uh, post-war reconciliation. That's what it's often called. But what you were talking about, Paolo, is where the person who, where the offender, is made to sit, and the whole village sits around him, it's usually him, in a circle, and they go around the circle, and everyone has to say something good about that person. Sometimes you have to stop and think. Well, he exists, anyway. <laughs> but everyone says something good about him, and it, it never seems to fail. And halfway around the circle, the person breaks down and feels emotionally able to say, I'm sorry for what I did. You take responsibility. I'm involved in a group, incidentally, that's writing a whole book on uh, atonement. You know, how when you discover that you've done something wrong, individually or collectively, you don't want to go into this trap of guilt, which is paralyzing, and then you go into denial, and you don't get anywhere. But then what do you do about it? How do you build up reconciliation? Yeah, Matthias? It w where? At birthday, birthday parties? Yes, I can see it's a lot nicer than charades, yeah. So I'm sorry I stole your puppy when you were 10 years old, and stuff like that. That would make a wonderful birthday party. Uh, yes, Paul. Oh, saying so, oh, I see what you're saying. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I was thinking, whoa, that would be a one weird kind of party. Uh, but you know, this is Berkeley. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is a very good idea. You're. <laughs> You're 20 years old today, and we, I remember the time you did thus and so, and you're such a nice thus and so. Yeah, fun party. Ashley and then Paul. Um, no, there's no inside or outside on this. I mean, provided if you bring in some kind of weird example that I don't know anything about, you're going to have to spend some time telling me about it. So, no, but uh, clearly anything that you know of that I can be made to know of that will work will be fine. So we talked about the paradigm case of reconstructive program on a grand scale, which was the TRC, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And I pointed out that I think it has a missing dimension because uh, it's treated legalistically and somewhat emotionally, but not what I would call concretely and ironically enough well, that would also be spiritually namely getting a person to work off what they have done I think I used this case uh, before with you that um, again this is on a small scale it's restorative justice but four white 
youth burnt down a black church in the south and the judge ordered them to rebuild the church. That's like perfect reconciliation work. Yeah? Yeah, it would fit within reconstructive program because th what we're trying to identify here are the types of dynamic. This is focused on your own community and it's positive and constructive, as it says. This is oppositional towards the other community. And this is means of bringing both communities together. So it's neat. It's a nice thing. Uh, hold on. Yeah, Paolo? Could you Well, I don't want to say too much about it because I've just invented reconstructive program this morning. So, you know, the field is pretty new. <laughs> but what I was thinking of was the large-scale application of reconciliation techniques to whole societies that have been involved in armed conflict. It doesn't necessarily mean nation-state against nation-state, but as in Africa, for example, where one whole section of the population ethnically divided was oppressing another. I think that until the millennium comes, or the rapture, whichever comes first, and everybody loves everybody, and people who don't love everybody have been burnt at the stake or dealt with in some appropriate manner, uh, there will be scope for, there will always be friction and tensions and separateness. And therefore, there will always be scope for recon reconstruction. So constructive program is where you're uh, let's say institutions that you need are not being provided by a group that's in charge, you provide them yourself. Obstructive is where you block the oppression, uh, not the oppressor, or no such thing, but you block the oppression. Uh, and reconstructive is where there has been, this is post-conflict mainly is what I'm thinking, post-conflict, yeah. So that's true, this is that's another great way this is breaking down. I'm really liking this more and more. This is pre-conflict, though it can also go on during and after. If, but if it's not pre-conflict, as our friend Dr. Saber was just saying, Jabber, I mean, it's going to be very difficult to do it after the conflict, because that's when all the disenfranchised people all become, oh, I was victimized before you were. And the next thing you know, you have these nice Bolsheviks who are being just swept off the stage by these nasty communists. Uh, what was I saying? This is pre-conflict, ideally, but it can be done any time. This is the conflict, and this is post-conflict. So this is very neat. Pre, during, and post. The, the longer this goes on, the more I think this is a, a correct technical term and should enter the vocabulary, and we should put it on our blog. Jenna. The Marshall Plan, uh, as you can tell, I'm a little bit hesitant about it because it was all on the material level. There was nothing in there about, let's take these poor kids who, when they were 15, 16 years old, they were inducted into the Hitler Youth. They had no idea what they were doing. They were idealistic. And they got so screwed up, let's take them and help them. As far as I remember, and I'm not that old to really remember, that was not part of the Marshall Plan. It was just economic reconstruction. So that could be a big piece of it, but I think we're talking about something deeper, more in spiritual. We, getting people to face off against one another and apologize, make restitution, and so forth. Okay. So while the final will tend to emphasize the latter half of the semester, it's not all going to be about today. So do think about some of the terms, people, events, and so forth. Alex? Um, you said that also violence is part of the Yeah, the set is, <coughs> these are the forms of violence. 
So we have direct violence. We have structural violence. And we have cultural violence. So direct violence, I think uh, nobody in America needs to ponder over what it means. We, I just was hearing some from a friend of mine, a young friend of mine, who visited New York, my hometown. And he was walking around saying, you know, what is this? I heard such terrible things about New York. And you know, everybody is smiling and happy. Then he went down into the subway, and some guy came barreling down the stairs, knocking over old ladies left and right. And a few paces behind him comes somebody waving a gun. He said, ah, oh, OK, this is New York. <laughs> it's not New York. But what I'm saying is we all know about, where are we? We all know about direct violence. What is structural violence? This is an important actual discovery. And I, I think we owe it mostly to Johann Galton. Jo Joanne? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes, well, you don't have to walk up to a kid and slap him in the face and say you're no good, but you just create a program that cuts off his funding for school lunches, and he's, he's undernourished and gets sick and becomes violent. And remember, Galton's definition of violence is any, any unnecessary compromise of, a human, of human fulfillment, something like that. So you inhibit somebody's growth. That is violence. And if you build something into society so it's part of the structure, then that is structural violence. And you can go around saying, I'm not doing anything. You know, I don't, I'm not carrying a gun. But you're passing laws which make it impossible for somebody to thrive. That's structural violence. Got some seats up here. OK. Do, do smile when you walk past the desk. <laughs> Um, and cultural violence, ah, good. Oh, I meant to say, incidentally, that I'm really sorry I won't be on campus on Thursday. I have to go to Boston to conduct a meditation retreat that was planned a long time ago. So if you want to see me today in my office hour and not see Maria Stefan, if you want to see me before the semester's out, it'll have to be today. Um, cultural violence is, well, OK. There is an organization in this country of which I have long been deeply suspicious. And today, or yesterday, my suspicions were confirmed. It's called the National Association of Scholars. And when I first heard about this thing, I said, hmm, I'm a scholar. I, I earn my livelihood writing these turgid articles that nobody can read. Uh, I tend to see reality divided into sets of three. That, that makes <laughs> um, that. And uh, my job description is taking simple ideas and making them complex enough so that intellectuals can understand them. So I said, why don't I join this society? And um, at first, it looked like they were talking about something quite serious, that there's been this Eurocentric culture that we've built up. And now it's suddenly being threatened. So I said, OK, I'm not using the word threatened. I'm using the word opened. <laughs> but yeah, this is interesting. And in fact, I was teaching comparative literature in those days. So I said, wow, you know, we are in the catbird seat, an expression which means we're in a very favorable position. Because we're comparative. You know, we're not the English department. No offense, but we're not the English department. We're comparative. We can do the whole world. It didn't happen. Nothing that I suggest seems to happen <laughs> at, this, at, this, at this place, anyway. Um, but I, the more I found out about this society, the more I realized that what they're trying to do is reestablish the hegemony of European culture and uh, fa fence, fence it off and reject the threat of these other cultures that have different ideas. So that is what I would call cultural violence, that he, everybody should drink Coca-Cola, everybody should wear what they call an IQ reducer, you know, have a baseball cap with the, the, the bill going back. Elizabeth. Uh, 
yeah, that would be one thing. You generally you do structural within your own society, but even that is breaking up. You know, WTO-style globalization is structural violence on a world stage, world scale. Um, there's another definition of cultural violence also that I want to share with you in a second. Yeah. Use, the worst example always was Nestle, right. because you had all of these mothers who were breastfeeding in Africa, had probably been doing that for about 300 million years. And you suddenly you rush in there and say, oh, breastfeeding is no good. We have this powder that you mix with clean water and give it to your baby. It's much better. And immediately everybody wants to do that. They forgot to mention there is no clean water. So you have babies dying of diarrhea by the hundreds and the thousands. There was a worldwide campaign against them. There's a Swiss-based company, I think, and they did, they did uh, reform a little bit. So that would be an example of globalized structural violence. But I think with cultural, Elizabeth, it's more about ideas. And with structural, it's more about products or legal systems and so forth. Like the old saying, the, the law is impartial. Neither rich nor poor are allowed to sleep under the bridge. That's structural violence because the rich don't have to. You know, poor people have to sleep under bridges, even in Japan. I, I saw them. Carolyn? Catherine, I mean, sorry. Uh, not to me. I, <laughs> I don't do cultural violence. No, uh, I don't know who came up with that term, actually. The other definition of it that I wanted to mention is using your culture to make people ready victims of violence uh, or perpetrators of it. And as I've been saying, every time I get a chance, I think advertising, this is what it does. You know, like President Bush has $141 billion worth of free advertising every year. Because every time you advertise to a person, that you're a material body, you're helpless, you need happiness that you get from outside, you're leading that person down a path which inevitably will create even direct violence. So we've been trying to trace out those connections all semester. Okay. Yeah, good question. Yeah, John? Moving on, okay. San Jose de, de Apartado is indeed part of a set, but you have to realize uh, it's not a person. It is a peace community. And uh, John Lindsay Poland from Fellowship of Reconciliation spoke about this a bit, that there are something like 50-ish of these communities. And again, this is something that's spreading all around the world, where people just say, Nobody can bring weapons into this turf. This is our town. We don't want any guns here. Uh, and those, those communities are not doing terribly well. They, uh, I just read about another case. But I did read about another case. Hang on. In, um, it was in Colombia, where all the armed factions, for once, agreed. They were on the same page. Peace communities are no good. And they started sending armed groups into the peace community to terrorize and round people up. And a large contingent of people just got together and took a, something like a long journey, 100, 120 miles, 200 kilometers, into the jungle to talk to the camp commanders of these paramilitaries. They ran out of transportation and walked the last 10, 12, 15 miles in the mud. And then just stood there and said, you have no right to do this to us. Don't come back to our community as long as you're carrying guns. And the FARC or whoever it was they were talking to was so impressed by their courage, which is like nonviolence 101, 
so impressed by the way they overcame their fear and the, the trouble they had gone through to do this, and I must say by the fact that they were talking to them instead of uh, you know, surrounding them or fighting them or something like that, that they agreed. They gave their agreement that we, we will not harass your community. So if you do it right, you can create an island of peace. And uh, Kenneth Boulding used to believe uh, that there were zones of peace around the world, like um, Northern Europe. Uh, in 1805, the, I guess that it was the Swedes who were, Swedes and Norwegians were duking it out with the Danes every couple of years. Suddenly, for some reason that nobody knows why, they said, the hell with it. Stop doing this. It's stupid. And they haven't had a war since. So they create a little zone where there's no war going on. And his thought was to identify those zones and strengthen them, hook them up, have them metastasize. Now you could add Holland into those North countries pretty easily, I think. And uh, before you know it, there'll be a majority, and you'll have a world of peace. I mean, I don't think that's going to happen that way, but it's, I think we should try everything, and that there would be one reasonable way of doing it. OK. Apartado. Apartado is the name of a river. I, I thought it was St. Joseph of the post office box when I first saw this. But, but it's not. It's the name of a river in Colombia. In Colombia. Yeah. But as I say, I'm not really sure that as we speak now, there still are 50 of them. In some cases, people have been chased off the land and made to relocate. Yeah. Actually. The set is, a, well, it's really sort of an institution, if you will, which is the self-declared peace community, a group of people who are you know, a geographical social group in a war zone of some kind or another, and Colombia is probably one of the worst that we've got, simply declares itself a weapons-free zone. I took a different route through Petaluma to get to my van pool this morning, and I, I saw a sign that said, drug-free zone. And I said, oh, we must be coming to a high school. And sure enough, we were. <laughs> but it's, it's that idea that you can create peace in an area and, and have it be inviolable. Arby? Yeah. Well, actually, it creates division right then and there. But what I think it creates a good kind of division, because the division is between those who want peace and those who don't. And let's get it out in the open. I think if we could do this in the Middle East, which I think more and more is the world's premier conflict, but if you could get the peace people in Israel and the peace people in Palestine to get together and say it's us against the right wing on both territories, You'd have a good, clean fight. I mean, it would be horrendous. <laughs> read nothing clean about it. But at least the lines of, of conflict would be drawn in the right place. So yes, it's true that in a way you're putting up a barricade and you're saying, we've got peace in here. You don't have it out there. But I think that's, a, that's recognizing a truth. And I think the fact that all of the armed paramilitaries and the government paramilitary, known as the Colombian Army, uh, they all agreed that this was a bad thing, was a good thing. Because it showed where the, where the split really lies between the desire for peace and the absence of that desire. Shannon. Navidanya? Uh, oh, yeah, that's right. We didn't get to talk about that very much. Uh, anyone know what this is? Marisa. Yes, Vandana, the first syllable, Vandana. Good, good, Vandana. Vandana Shiva is a brilliant uh, Indian physicist who has dedicated her entire career to fighting globalism 
at the agricultural, ecological level in India. And uh, she travels around a lot, has been to California several times, but I, I don't think we've ever got her here, which is a good thing for the Peace Studies Student Association to work on next year. Uh, Shannon, you, you're going to be, it's not called Peace Studies Student Association anymore, is it? That PACS student group? Yeah, whatever, whatever that is. I can pronounce Vandana Shiva, but I can't pronounce that thing. <laughs> but you're but you're in charge of it next year, right? Oh, okay, okay, great. Okay, we have complete nonviolence takeover. <laughs> uh, that's the kind I like. So try and get her here. Uh, her her organization is called Navdanya, and in Hindi that means the new dispensation. Da is da means to give. Danya is gift. Nava means new new dispensation. And it's a think and do tank. In fact, I think very highly of this organization. It does very good, concrete work. When I was talking about the uh, Reconstruction Alliance, Rebuilding Alliance, that is a classic example of how you do something concrete which has powerful symbolic significance. You're rebuilding a home. Nothing could be more direct and obvious. So um, they have been instrumental in a number of campaigns. I think they've been involved in the dam. The, the, they're connected with uh, that other group, which is Narmada Bachao Andalan, the Narmada Save the Narmada campaign or movement and so forth. And I guess the main thing that she's been working on is the most horrible structural violence that the globalized world is carrying out these days, which is terminator seeds. You take farmers, and incidentally, farmers are committing suicides in the tens of thousands in India today. If you take farmers who've you know, been using their own seeds year after year after year, forever. And you know we do this at our, at our communities. This is very, very real to me. We have a special lettuce patch. We let it go to seed, so we can take the seeds, and we don't have to buy anybody's seeds. So far, the rabbits have not discovered our garden, so we're doing pretty well. Uh, the, but what these companies do, and it's mainly been Monsanto, is they modify the seeds so that they only reproduce once, and then they die. There's a phenomenon in biology. I forget which of you are MCSB majors, but there's a phenoma, phenomenon called apopopsy, which means dying off, which means that genes seem to be programmed to last for 50 generations, and then they die, which is probably a good idea. I mean, I, I had a colleague who always kept his lecture notes in blue books because they would fall apart after three years, and he'd have to see if he had any new ideas for that uh, subject. So that's probably what nature had in mind. You know, keep, keep on working until you get to the Berkeley student, and then you can cast it in concrete. But anyway, um, this is a very, very harmful psychologically in every way. It pushes people from poverty into destitution very quickly. And she's been trying to rouse consciousness among the farmers that they get them not to, to buy these seeds, not to accept them. The tragic thing is that the government is not helping. The, the government of India is kind of against its own people and with the multinationals, generally speaking. Senorita. Uh-huh. Yes. Yes. I think the ideas around it are so powerful that you could easily call it cultural violence. And it's, it's probably the deepest case that we're going to have of attacking life at its ultimate essence and you know, abolishing the personhood of people and everything they've built their society on. Uh, I don't know. Another example that's just popping into my mind for some reason was during the raids, uh, the air raids on Cambodia. 
I, I read one day that uh, we were bombing elephants from the air. And I thought, you know, this is unforgivable. This, this is an affront because elephants are sacred to those people. I mean, I, ele everything's sacred, right? But uh, to those people, elephants are, you know, temple animals. They're sacred. To bomb them from the air with explosives, I could not imagine anything more against life than that. I knew it was going to be over soon. And at that point, we shut down the university, incidentally. That's Marcella. That's very significant. Yes. Yes, that's right. That had the same kind of significance for the Native Americans who uh, culled them and dealt with them in a balanced way, and it was sustainable and could go on forever. And pretty soon, you had these tourists shooting them from railroad trains just because, uh, you know, for the fun of it. Ah. There's a lot of violence out there, people. I think we have to be very, very determined in getting this thing done. Yeah? Well, it depends which direction you're running it in. Uh, you know, globalism, where you have a nonviolent activist going to another continent, uh, or these examples that I was just telling you about, where somebody from the TRC in South Africa goes to a meeting. In Bethlehem, globaliz globalism, globalization, the process, globalization from below is ex the, the antidote to globalization from below. It, it's, what we're objecting to is centralization and exploitation. And when that's done on a global scale, then we have globalization from above. Okay, other, I know you've been what would be the equivalent of burning the midnight oil, uh, keeping the internet hopping all night long, uh, Googling everything in sight. Uh, you must have other questions for earlier on. Yeah, John? EZLN, pues. Que significa EZLN? Let's see. I need just two or three people that are writing papers on this movement. Yeah, okay. Samantha, ¿qué está? Muy bien. It's the, if my Spanish is holding up, that means it's the Army of National Liberation, the Zapatista Army for National Liberation, right? If you don't know who, know who Emiliano Zapata was, Go see Marlon Brando's best movie, which is called Zapata. That that is a heartthrob. I mean, uh, af after Los Tres Amigos, that's the the funny, the best movie that I would recommend. Black and white old Brando film. But this is uh, okay. Who? Why is? Why are those letters up here on our sacred blackboard? What does that have to do with nonviolence? I think anyone but Sam should answer this question. <laughs> Right, I did. Very mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think well, we felt good about it being constructive program, and in terms of whether it's uh, see we, what's going to really make the difference in terms of are they violent or are they nonviolent would be here. And so I think what we were saying, and I probably would stick with that, is that they are a nonviolent wannabe. Maybe after I read Sam's paper, I'll have a different idea. But <laughs> they were, uh, it's an interesting case for us. We've gotten a lot of mileage out of these gray areas. This is very gray because they used violence not to hurt the opponent, but to gain attention. They knew perfectly well, and unfortunately it was true, that you could be a nonviolent movement until the cows come home, however you say that in Spanish. Hasta que las vacas regresan. And uh, you, nobody would pay the slightest attention. This is the tragic case of the matter. Take a look at the, uh, look at the Albanians, the Kosovars. That is incredibly courageous, persistent, every day at noon, being out there in the main square, 
in Pristina. So starting to succeed, getting their university back. Zero recognition from the mass media. One person comes to a funeral with a gun and he says, we're the KLA, and it's all over the newspapers. And sure enough, we had to resolve that conflict by violence. So knowing all this, because the subcomandante is no fool, several of our graduates from our program have actually been in love with him. So I, I know he's, he's got to be a pretty decent guy. He, uh, he said, we're going to have to get attention through of successful violent resistance. And they actually succeeded in turning a large portion of Chiapas into an autonomous region where the federal government doesn't really control stuff. Then they tried to renounce their arms and, and do things through civil practice. So parallels that suggest themselves would be the uh, IRA and the um, uh, all the initials are kind of tumbling through my brain. Don't let this happen to you on the final. Uh, <laughs> the South African group that Nelson Mandela belonged to. What, what am I thinking of? The, the, now I've done it. ANC. 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 I knew that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. These are groups that used violence up to a point and then converted themselves into civil society. Groups, and I think by and large, that's what the EZLN has been doing. However, as I say, I haven't read Sam's paper yet, so I'm going to be know much more about this in a few hours. Harvey? Ejercicio Zapatista de Liberación Nacional. Nice, nice acronym. Otra pregunta, sonst noch etwas. Shannon, don't be sorry. <laughs> Ruckus Society, good, yeah. Who wants to raise some? Tell us what that's about. Let's see, Let's see. anybody, somebody, has, okay. Elizabeth, okay, you go ahead. <laughs> That's Marisa's outfit. No, not, not necessarily. Yeah, they do teach you how to live in trees, but they also teach you how to hang banners from bridges, how to scale uh, office buildings, even though you're not Spider-Man. Boy, did that make me mad. $59 million the first weekend for Spider-Man 3. Oh, I was furious. Gandhi only made $25 million. Human man one. Um, yes, we brought the we brought them in under what rubric? What connection? Why were we studying them? Training. Yeah, we were talking about if you look at the whole enchilada, where where all is nonviolence happening? We talked about organization, new forms of organization. We talked about training, and it, under training, if you recall, we talked about different levels of training, like very deep personal spiritual work at one end of the spectrum, and the other end, just how to conduct yourself when you're being arrested, how to use window cleaning equipment to scale a skyscraper in Chicago, things like that. But they are, uh, I mean, the interesting thing about Ruckus Society is that this is a kind of training which always had to be ad hoc. You know, you would hope that you had somebody in your affinity group who had been at Seattle the previous season so they would know a little bit what to do. But now you have people studying this formally and offering trainings in it, it's sort of like a nonviolent uh, boot camp. It's very much like, yeah. Uh, this is a good question. I think we would be talking basically about obstructive programs. Except if they get into the area of culture jamming, you know, they try to put up alternative messages to commercialization, maybe it would shade off into something else. But yes, it's about what you're going to do when it, uh, you are up against. Um, 
Three years ago, when the attack began on Iraq, there was a group that was planning to go into Vandenberg Air Force Base here in California, which it turns out was the CCC, the Command Control Center for the war in Iraq. That's how, that's how modern warfare works. It's all being done on computers, being sent over there. And Vandenberg uh, is a big base. It's impossible to keep people out to defend the whole perimeter. People were getting ready to go in there with balloons and aluminum, strips of aluminum foil tied to the balloons. If they would release these balloons, they would mess up the radar and would screw up the war in Iraq. However, uh, two things happened to deter that particular operation. I'm just mentioning it because this is the kind of thing that ruckus gets involved in. First of all, they realized they could end up killing American troops. And that might not play very well <laughs> with, uh, with this particular country. Second, the base commander issued a statement saying that anybody entering the base without authorization will have to be regarded as an enemy intruder and will be shot on sight. So that also deterred people. So for either of these reasons or both, they, they decided not to do it. But this is by way of answering your question, John. Yes, it is obstructive, definitely. Yeah, it's a bad obstructive program. And that's a good way to think about these things. How can we, you know, in which categories can we put stuff? Okay, your last chance to ask the question that may be the difference between you're getting into medical school or not. If you don't have any other questions, what we could do, do you have? OK. No, no. I, f I'm, I can do with three minutes, John. So you take the first two. I'll take the last three. <laughs> I, I, think, I think I hear what you're saying. <laughs> OK. First of all, what country are we in? Where, where is this guy? It's a guy, by the way. <laughs> so this is uh, Sri Lanka. I'm surprised I didn't talk about it more, because that's where Nonviolent Peace Force has its first operation, its pilot project. Arya Ratne is um, a distinguished Buddhist leader. He's quite elderly now, and his son is taken over from him. Arya Ratne, in case you're interested, means noble jewel, just whatever. And the organization is called Sarvodaya, which means uplift of all. And it's a very good example of mostly constructive program with some very courageous obstructive features to it. Uh, two years ago, they had a peace meditation, which was attended by, are you ready for this? 600,000 people. Probably the biggest meditation ever. <laughs> you know, it sounds funny to say, like a big meditation, small meditation. It's like Hollywood version of what meditation is. but. But I know people who were there, and they said it was an experience that you could never forget, being in this place, 600,000 people. Just to be in a place where 600,000 people aren't making any noise, much less meditating, would be amazingly powerful. So it's been it was very early. It was influenced by Gandhi. The term Sarvodia is a Gandhian term. And uh, they, they very cleverly used Buddhist values and indigenous practices in Sinhala villages to overcome the war. They created a 500-year plan for peace, which you can see on their website. We're now at year 473, I think. Um, I mean, 473 to go. Uh, and uh, they have done some wonderful things, like that knowing the symbolism of food they have had uh, Sinhala villagers go to Tamil villages and sit down and feed people. 
very powerful, symbolic. Um, where would we put that? Interesting. Kind of pre-conflict reconstruction. I don't know exactly where we would put that. But, um, and he himself is an extremely courageous man. He, he, did, he did something similar to what Gandhi once did. Somebody threatened to kill him, and he immediately went to see that person, talk to him, and said, here I am. Do your worst. And the guy was you know, so, so impressed that he couldn't do anything to him. So it's the scope of the program, both in time and in space, is very, very impressive. And it's, uh, it's kind of unfortunate that it has not prevailed. And the conflict has spun out of hand. And there's three or four groups all on one another. And it's been very ugly. But yeah, his name is Arya Ratne. And he's a Gandhian who carried that stuff into Sri Lanka. If you wanted to Google it, I think you look up American Sarvodaya Institute. I think, I think that's where you'll find it. Anyway, Sarvodaya should, should do it. OK, so I think what I will suggest is why don't we stop now, take a couple of minutes to do your uh, evaluation. Need any help with those, just let me know. And uh, you have been a wonderful group, and good luck next Tuesday. Thank you.